Welcome everyone to our third mental health forum for the fall semester um, at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Um, this present the presentations and this panel discussion today will be recorded um, and will be available after, um, after a few days on our website and also on the Harvard Teach Chan YouTube channel. Um, today's event is a um, is focused on LBT, LBTQ mental health, and um, it is going to be a panel discussion, a panel, a number of presentations, and then a panel discussion. And then we will also have um, questions and answers from the audience via um, the um, Q and A feature. So if you can use the Q and A feature for your questions, that would be great. Um, and um, Let's get started, um, making sure it, all the logistics. So our first um, panelist is Dr. Um, Jerry Davison, who is um, professor of um, psychology at the University of Southern California. And um, he also is a, um, you know, actually I just wanna say, he's also one of my heroes. Um, my PhD, people may not know, my PhD is actually in clinical psychology. Um, and I've always admired Dr. Davison and I'm going to um, let him take it away. I'm gonna do short, short introductions to each of our speakers so we don't spend a lot of time on their, their long bios, but go ahead, Jerry. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you very much. I'm gonna try now to share the screen. That's my first um, challenge. Uh, and as you can see, it's already challenging. Okay, let's see if this works now. Good, now I'll start my slide. So I'm gonna do a very quick summary of something that I first held forth on back in 1974. <clears throat> it was a presidential address, the Association for Advancement of Behavior Therapy. And um, just for, I, people will have the, the references later or the slides later on. These are just a few of my com uh, um, publications that, from which I'm drawing. Um, if you're interested in podcasts, there's a backstory on this, sort of the more personal account of how this happened um, is on this podcast. And then there's a documentary that will be released uh, in a few months, I hope, um, based on uh, my work and, and Chuck Silverstein's work on in this area. Now, this next slide, I can't really read the whole thing, but <clears throat> it's a, it's a make-believe to sort of get you in a mindset of what things were like back then. I mean, things have really changed for the better. So this is, I sort of take you back to like 46 years ago. It was a different world then in many ways. And this is this little uh, apocryphal press release is, a, is intended to convey the idea, the predicament that gay people were in in those days and for some years thereafter. And I think it's changed. And the, the thrust of this is that the, the governor is, is uh, devoting a lot of money to setting up a change of religion um, uh, programs for um, for um, Protestants so that they can be converted either to Catholicism or Judaism or Islam or whatever. Um, but he says, we, we're not going to force these services on anybody. It's only if you really want to change. And that's really the predicament um, separate from coercive programs, which are really anathema in my mind. But the, the, I'm talking at this point primarily from the point of view of of people who come in for a vol voluntary change. These are the topics that I'm gonna to go over and it's gonna be rather quick. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, but um, we'll do the best we can. <clears throat> There's a section um, on my presentation that has to do with homosexuality and how it's changed over time. The takeaway from this is that the, the American Psychiatric Association brought about certain changes that they thought were changes. But in my mind, they were phony changes. They were not changes at all. They basically shifted to, well, you're not mentally ill, but only if it bothers you. Um, and um, they changed that over time. They finally, uh, I think, knocked out all together in DSM-5. So for those of you interested in, in the history with DSM, that can be, you can be looked at. Um, and some states have begun to ban these conversion treatments. Get to that in a moment. Okay. A basic point of view that I have is that therapists never make ethically uh, neutral or politically neutral decisions. Most therapists think that they do reject that point of view. I believe that psychiatric or psychological neutrality is a is a myth. And there I draw on a, the sort of this old this uh, 
in vernacular, fish doesn't know he's swimming in the water, is that we're not, not really aware of these things because it feels natural to us. And this is the way things were with regard to changing people from gray to three. Um, there was been a lot of research that um, the, the Bieber study in 62, uh, which if you read it, is a, ter a terrible study methodologically and logically in my mind. Um, those of you who are pantically oriented and interested in, in what I regard as poor so-called research could read that. And he had, he um, claimed to have found differences in the upbringing of gays versus straight patients, and therefore homosexuality was an illness <clears throat> where he was really defining homosexuality as an illness from the very beginning. Uh, no cure without a disease. <clears throat> the reason that we get involved, I believe, as health professionals is that we think that there's a problem. So in this, uh, in this uh, paper, I talk about how can we honestly speak about non-prejudice when we participate or support regimens that, that can basically condone societal prejudice. And in this statement here, I'm beginning to take what ends up being a more a community site or I think in your lingo here in the school, your school public health point of view. Um, I believe that a lot of psychological problems, not all of them, I think maybe according, you know, from using Neil's comment, some of, of nature is carved at its joints. <clears throat> but for the most part, I think that what people like myself deal with, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> is uh, we construct problems. People come in feeling bad and our, theoretical perspective, our paradigm transforms people's problems into, into um, categories or, or uh, generally constructions by the clinician. Uh, I have a section here, I believe my two co-panelists will be talking more about, but um, part of the so-called non-voluntary nature of voluntary desires to change are the extreme prejudices against gay people in terms of hate crimes, minority stress, and loathing and self-hatred. So the question is how voluntary are these expressed desires? Now, I wish I could read through this because it's so beautifully phrased by my friend, Charles Silverstein. This was part of a symposium that he gave in 1972 that really triggered my own change of heart um, or in the words of the film, uh, my own conversion perspective um, because he points to, points to the, the experiences of most gay people uh, growing up being called faggot and they go, and it's sin and they, and they talk about illness and they go to the council center and they're gonna be cured. This doesn't really create a, a, a situation where they can be regarded as um, voluntarily wanting to change. And so I came up with this proposal. The bottom line is don't attempt sexual orientation even if the patient asks for it. And this is the part that um, I'm not sure if, if at the time Chuck got to this point, I don't think he did, but in any event, I got to this point that and this is the hardest thing to swallow because on the face of it really deny, who am I to deny uh, people who are hurting a, an avenue towards their health? And, and my point of view that was to take a more, um, that we're not simply solitary technicians, but that we work within a social context. And Seymour Halleck put it very nicely in his Politics of Therapy book. I'm gonna move right along. Um, people often don't distinguish between the the empirical and the ethical and, or political, I think that's a problem. They're usually separate. <clears throat> and um, this is a, I'm almost reluctant to make this point on, on the web, but I will, I do it with my undergraduates especially, is that if we're really concerned only with whether we can do anything and therefore we should, which I don't think holds, is holds at all, I have a surefire cure for all ailments. And what it is, is, um, putting a bullet in the patient's head. Now this bizarre suggestion of obviously, which I don't mean seriously, I was trying to make the point that we can do certain things and make people one way or another, but it doesn't mean that we should. And this, this can be extended to all sorts of uh, interventions that professionals make. So plastic surgeons are a good example, uh, changing people's noses, shape of eyes, whatever. You can do these things, does it mean you should? And if you look behind it, I think you'll find decisions like this, a lot of prejudice. I'm almost done. Uh, my former mentor, Perry London's phrase of secular priest is very apt here. We are, we uh, helpers, especially in mental health, helpers are society secular priests, whether we like it or not. People look to us for, for assistance, for guidance in making 
what in many cases are moral issues. And um, this gets me into, into morality. Uh, I see individual psychotherapy and uh, any sort of interventions, they basically they occur in a social context. Well, I misspelled it here. An example is we, we, we're construed in all sorts of ways that again, fish doesn't always swimming in the water. And I, just one little example here is the Arasoff misspelled here is an example where uh, helpers and even teachers, um, when we believe that our students or patients are uh, being harmed or <clears throat> at risk of being harmed, uh, we have a duty to protect, um, to warn or protect. And this takes us out of the context of the individual relationship. So we're constrained in all sorts of ways. So I'll stop and, um, and thank you very much. Thank you, Jerry. And um, I think for all the presentations today, we probably could spend hours on each one. Um, part of the reason I asked Jerry to present was because of the um, historical, his own, um, his, his own conversion, but his, the historical perspective, because I can remember when I was in college, I had friends whose parents um, um, tried to get them to go to conversion therapy. So um, while I, uh, hopefully this is less usual now, it's not, the, I'm old, but I'm not that old yet. So it's not that long ago that um, this was sort of, this was uh, you know, happening. Um, so the next speaker is Dr. Alan Meyer. Um, and uh, it's nice to be, to see him again, even if it's virtual. Um, he's a distinguished senior scholar for public policy at the Williams Institute for Sexual Orientation, Law and Public Policy at UCLA School of Law, an adjunct professor in community health sciences at the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health and Professor Emeritus of Sociomedical Sciences at Columbia University, which is where we met. Um, take it away, Alon, thank you. Thank you, and thank you, uh, Jerry, for this um, historical perspective. Um, it comes in a great time because um, for me, yesterday, I watched this uh, film that I recommend um, that talks about this period uh, that you are describing. The film is called Cured and Charles uh, uh, Silverstein is there as well as many other psychiatrists and psychologists who heralded the changes in a DSM and, and really moved us all um, to where we are today. And it also interestingly ties with what I wanted to talk about, which is um, my current studies uh, me and uh, my uh, co-investigators um, are looking at how the past 50 to 60 years in U.S. society have impacted the experience of sexual and gender minorities and um, what, what, what is the impact of that. So um, as many of, some of you may know, minority stress Theory, which is something I've been working on uh, uh, since, um, since my studies at Columbia uh, many years ago, um, that that theory suggests that social environment, in particular transphobia and homophobia, determine the mental health of LGBT people in causing more stress and therefore more disorder, suicide, substance use, etc. So what we were interested in this uh, new study uh, is, was in, okay, so 60 years have passed since the kind of beginning of the gay uh, uh, rights movement, at least the kind of uh, symbolic uh, beginning. And, um, if somebody went to sleep in 1969 and woke up today, uh, they would be completely well unrecognizable for so many reasons. But in terms of uh, the place and situation of LGBT people, it'll be quite remarkable. Um, homosexuality is not a disease. Uh, sodomy is not a criminal. Uh, people can marry a person of the same sex. Uh, people are not allowed to be discriminated against LGBT people by the US constitution. Uh, those are all decisions that have come quite recently, uh, the, the latter part, the, the legal decisions, 
and have really seriously changed the situation of where LGBT people live and how they're reared, like how they grow up. And what we were interested in is looking at different generations of LGBT people, how does that influence their life, their identities, their exposure to stress, and therefore the mental health outcome? Because again, starting from the observation that homophobia and transphobia leads to more stress and therefore more mental health disorders. And we, we know we've observed a mental health disorder disparities uh, for, um, well, it's been recognized since 2000, I would say, as far as Healthy People 2010. So how, has the, how have these changes um, affected uh, the health profile of LGBT people? And what we found was, I would say, both surprising and unsurprising. What was surprising is that it hasn't impacted the life of LGBT people in the amazing ways that we had hoped. It hasn't impacted the lives of LGBT people even in the amazing ways that sometimes we see covered in newspaper articles about kids coming out in school and everybody supports them and football players coming out in high school and all their friends arrange a date for them and uh, transgender women becoming homecoming queen and everybody loves them. This, it turns out to be, is not the typical experience of LGBT people who are young. And we looked at three what we call generations but really cohorts of LGBT people 18 to 25 year old this was uh, when we started recruiting in 2016 uh, 34 to 41 and 52 to 59 so the the last group that we call the pride generation these are people who came of age during this time that Jerry was just talking about in the late 60s 70s and to make things a little brief, and we have a whole range of papers on that, and I can add our website later in the chat. Um, what we found that the younger generation, just focusing on them now, those who were 18 to 25 uh, uh, four years ago, were, they came out much earlier. So they felt more accepted by their families or at least thought that they were more accepted enough to be out at very young ages. Interestingly, everybody in all the generations, everybody realized, as we call it, that they were gay at the same age, more or less, around early teenage, like around 12, let's say. All of the generations, everybody. But it took the older generations years, sometimes decades, to actually come out into their late 20s. In the younger generation, it was only a few years later. By age 16, they were coming out to people. But what we didn't see affected as strongly is exposure to the stressors, what I've called minority stress processes. And among those stressors is actually conversion therapy. And what we found is that about 7% had experienced a attempt to change their sexual orientation. This is talking now about the LGB sample alone. 7% throughout the generation. So this has not increased and it did not decrease over these years. So we're talking about people who were 18 in 2016, they experienced that within the 2010s, let's say. Um, so that was a little surprising. What was also surprising to me is that uh, minor uh, microaggressions and major discriminatory events did not reduce to these generations. And then when you consider that, it was less surprising that mental health outcomes did not reduce. And in fact, suicide attempts were somewhat higher. Now we have a problem of recall and people who are older may have not recalled as much, uh, but um, regardless of that potential bias, 
we found very, very high rates of suicide, continue to find very high rates of suicide attempts in the younger generations. And at the 18 to 25, which is multiple times higher than you find in general population or mostly straight youth, uh, uh, young people. And this finding was, as I said, surprising and not surprising because we've already known from the YRBS studies, the Youth uh, Risk Behavior Survey that take place in US high schools, we've already seen that there. So we were prepared to find something similar despite hoping that we will see great improvements. And the last point I would make as far as conversion therapy, we looked in particular at that. And um, we found that people who experience conversion therapy were actually more likely to attempt suicide. And that was in a study where we controlled for many negative events that happened to these people during their childhood and youth. So those are the A's or the uh, adverse childhood experiences. So even if you control for that, if you adjust for that, if you, if you kind of take that into account that there may be differences that, that other issues that could lead to suicide attempt, uh, um, we found that the uh, people in the all of the generations were more likely to attempt suicide uh, after conversion therapy. And this was again, a confirmation or support of a finding that I had years before in New York in a completely different study, completely different sample, where we found that people who went to therapy, we looked at, this is something that people don't normally look at. We looked at people who went to therapy prior to the day that we knew they had attempted suicide. So anytime prior to that, and compare them to people who didn't attempt suicide, but also went to therapy. And we found that going to therapy did not actually reduce the risk of suicide. The, again, there are other issues that could be controlled here and need to look at that some we did and some we couldn't, but overall there was no difference. So going to a therapist did not change. Uh, whether a person uh, attempted suicide. But going to a religious counselor increased the risk of suicide attempts. So all of these findings together confirm what we know and, and what, as Jerry mentioned, is we know from an ethical perspective to be wrong. We know from anecdotal, anecdotal evidence that there has been um, reports of the damage of conversion therapy. And at least in this studies and others, we've seen that uh, it also has serious mental health effects, including suicide attempts. Uh, so in summary, I would say we have gone a long way, um, but for many reasons, the lives of LGBT people has not changed dramatically enough. And just to give one clue to this, is when you begin to look at people's lives and what they report, you begin to see, oh, I grew up in a religious family. I grew up in a religious community that, that, that uh, told me that it was wrong. Uh, I went to a school that nobody supported me. So while we see great changes in a kind of political arena, uh, it hopefully takes time and will reach the individual level environment eventually, but it hasn't done that yet, I feel. Thank you. Thanks, Alon. Um, I have about a million questions, but <laughs> I will let it go. We'll go on. And um, that was very sobering um, and uh, I guess not surprising, but I maybe I hoped to be surprised. Um, so our next speaker um, is Sabra Katz Weiss. Weiss. Um, she's assistant professor, uh, di sorry, assistant professor, Division of Adolescent and Young Adult Medicine at Boston's Children's Hospital, Department of Pediatrics at Harvard Medical School, and also Department um, of Social and Behavioral Sciences at Harvard TH Chan School of Public Health. She's also um, co-director of Harvard SOGI, which is the Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity and Expression Health Equity Research Collaboration. Um, and welcome. And Sabra's 
from my same institution, but we've never met, although I know Alon and Jerry, so um, nice to meet you, Sabra. Thank nice you for being you here. Well. Thank you. Just go ahead and um, share my screen. All right, hopefully you can see my slides. Um, so I'm going to be taking us in a bit of a more specific direction um, than Dr. Davison and Dr. Meyer um, did. I think they really set the stage for us in a, in a broader sense, and I'm, I'm going to get a little more specific here um, and talk just for a few minutes about transgender and gender diverse youth and their families. I have no conflicts um, to disclose. I wanted to just spend a quick moment on terminology. Um, so when I use the term transgender and gender diverse or TGD, I'm talking about people for whom their gender identity differs from society's expectations based on sex assigned at birth. And TGD can refer to people with binary identities or non-binary identities. And cisgender refers to people for whom their gender identity aligns with society's expectations based on sex assigned at birth. So I also wanted to position myself a bit in this research by sharing um, a few relevant identities that I bring to this work. Um, and those are cisgender woman, queer and bisexual, white researcher, advocate, um, and also the parent of an assumed cisgender child as, as far as we know at this point in, in his young life. So why transgender and gender diverse youth and families? Um, Kirsten asked us to spend a moment talking about this. So I wanted to share that I've had a really long standing academic interest in gender development um, and change over time. I have a lot of gendered women's studies training, um, got a PhD in developmental psych, which sort of provides evidence for this. And I also feel a strong responsibility as a member of the LGBTQ community with relative privilege um, based on some of the identities that I shared to really center the experiences of marginalized members of our community um, of which I would place TGD youth. So we have a, a growing body of research at this point demonstrating that compared to cisgender youth, TGD youth have higher rates of many different mental health concerns um, and related risk behaviors. This is a, a short list of, of some of those. And some recent research that has come out this year um, looking at sub, subgroup differences um, found that trans boys and non-binary youth who are assigned female um, were the highest risk groups for some of these outcomes. Mental health concerns and risk behaviors among this sample are often attributed to um, gender minority stress which Dr. Meyer talked about um, already, so I won't go into detail there, but just to say that in my work, I often um, focus in on the family context to see how gender minority stress may be manifesting in this particular environment or context. So how, how does gender minority stress manifest in, in families? Um, TGD youth are more likely than cisgender youth to experience maltreatment um, as a child by their parents and caregivers. And research has found that family rejection is associated with um, poor mental health in this population. But family can also play a really critical protective role for these youth. And strong family relationships in particular support health and well being of youth, in part by buffering against stress related to. Um, the stigma associated with TGD identity and minimizing um, health inequities. And research has found that TGD youth with higher levels of family support um, and better family connectedness report better mental health, um, providing some evidence for this protective role of family. So this brings us um, to one of my primary projects that I wanted to talk very briefly about, the Trans Teen and Family Narratives Project. Um, this project is funded by a grant from NICHD um, and the Boston Children's Hospital Aerosmith Foundation. The aim of this grant is to investigate how the family context affects TGD youth's health and well being over time and identify um, types of support needed by these families. 
This project took a community-based approach. Um, it was longitudinal with five waves of data collected across two years. And we collected interviews and surveys um, from TG, TGD youth and their siblings and caregivers. The sample included 33 families representing 96 family members. Um, the, sample, the sample is um, mostly white and 40% of caregivers had a graduate degree. And um, all three of the types of family members represented different gender identities. Um, this slide represents the youth's report of their own mental health at wave one. And you can see that the numbers are, are quite high, particularly for reported self-reported self-harm and um, depression symptoms. And notably, this is a sample in which um, the youth and families are participating together. So there is a baseline level of support that might look quite different um, from many other families with, with TGD youth. So we were pretty surprised um, that these numbers were so high. And from the caregiver's perspective, we also collected data on um, mental diagnoses at wave one um, and also found quite high numbers for self-injury disorder, depression disorder, and anxiety disorder. We also looked to see how family functioning was related to trans youth's mental health at wave one. And we found that TGD youth who reported better family communication and higher family satisfaction had better mental health and higher self-esteem and resiliency. So providing some nice, some nice evidence for that um, protective role of family in this sample. And interestingly, we found that caregivers and siblings reports of family functioning were not significantly related to transgender youth's mental health. So we, we looked at family functioning as reported by the different types of family members and really found that transgender youth's own perceptions of family functioning were most relevant for their mental health. So what are some of the implications of this work for supporting TGD youth and their families? Since we found that TGD youth's perception of family functioning has the greatest impact on their mental health, it's really critical to involve the whole family in supporting TGD youth because it really is a family systems um, process that they're going through. But prioritizing TGD youth's own perspective is really critical um, for uh, improving their own mental health. And this research also demonstrates that different family members have different perceptions of family functioning and support, um, suggesting that unique types of support may need to be provided to um, different family members. So just some brief acknowledgements, um, our funders and the many people who were involved um, in the TTFN project. And thank you. Thank you, Sabra. That was terrific. And um, folks, uh, to folks who are on, we will um, post uh, slides and things so people can see if they if they missed something, or um, um, and we can also post the papers and things in the chat. So, um, I'm gonna my first question. Um, I'm gonna ask a few questions, and then um, there's Q and A's. There's questions coming in from the audience, so people should feel free to post them there. Um, and you know, one of the questions I have, and maybe we can start with Jerry, you can each time answer this, is having heard from you all now, I'm a bit, as someone whose uh, work focused on mental health, but not on this particular area, I'm a bit discouraged, actually. Um, I think I was, I was hoping to hear, <laughs> I, mean, I naively, um, that things had improved more um, in terms of developed a stress experience by LGBTQ youth and mental health outcomes and partly from my own you seeing you know my son's experience with friends and how it, it versus like how i you know how i was raised so i guess maybe starting with jerry then alan then sabra just like what do you think what needs to be done that hasn't been done since we have had some of these big policy changes and i know that's there's probably a million things but maybe there's you could each say it uh you know couple things or what you think might be most important or I don't know Jerry if you have thoughts. <clears throat> well I I think there's good news and bad news. I mean for me the good news is when when I held forth on these things back in 74, I would never have imagined that things would be so much better than they are today. Um, even with you know Stonewall having taken place five years before I 
spoke out and um, you know, societal changes happen slowly. So I am really um, pleasantly surprised by the advances at the highest level of society in terms of announcements by the Supreme Court, change in state laws. I had, for example, never dreamed that conversion therapy, whether for minors or people generally, would be actually uh, rendered illegal at the, at the um, uh, state level. Um, the, um, the APA, uh, both APAs, um, if I may say, came around to my point of view, it took them at least 20 years to, um, but I was glad that, that it happened. So these are all good things. However, I've always cautioned people when I've talked about th this, uh, these things, if a change not only happens, often happens slowly, but also it happens at different times in different, play, in, in different areas, different parts of society. Um, uh, what we're talking about here is easier to talk about in large metropolitan areas like Los Angeles or Boston or Chicago or, or um, um, Palm Beach, Florida, but less easy to talk about than in um, you know, other parts of the country. Um, flyover country, if you will. So these, so we have to be very careful about, you know, assuming that these things are going to take place uniformly and with as much, um, 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 uh, you know, magnitude of change as as we would hope. But having said that, I, I agree with you, uh, Karsten, that that it's that things have not changed a great deal. But from the point of view of um, someone who's been around a long time, I've, I've seen the changes happening um, uh, more quickly and more uh, substantially than I assumed they would be. They, this obviously it says there's a great deal more to do. And you know, the, the changes that have taken place are probably the, the, the ones that are, more, are easier to take place, but the whole context, if you will, the conversation, the social conversation that, that is available now is, is, is light years different from what it was in the um, in the in the seventies and and earlier than that. Thank you. What about Alon, do you want to? Yeah, uh, I think um, again, without any doubt, things are remarkably different from a social, even social acceptance, but certainly legal um, and and medical. Um, we should say that all medical societies on, and social work and psychology uh, um, proclaim that conversion therapy is a bad thing. They don't condone it and they think it's damaging. So um, I think what all of this made me think about is how in public health, those of us who are in public health always think about uh, upstream interventions and how once you fix the kind of uh, uh, system, everything else will fall into place. And of course, I still think that is important. And those legal changes are prerequisite. You know, they're so important to, to, to have any social change. But at the same time, uh, social attitudes and um, um, conventions don't stop so uh, abruptly as 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 we can get a even a Supreme Court decision, which also don't don't happen abruptly. Uh, and what this uh, study made me think about. So when we started doing the generation study, the one I mentioned about the three generations, the three cohorts, we had a quantitative uh, survey, but also a qualitative sur and a study. Uh, uh, on uh, we interviewed 191 people across five different uh, areas in the United States. And even early on when we were just doing the quality assurance part of it, of the interviews, one of the, and I was so excited to hear young people's perspectives uh, because this was a long uh, life history. And one of the very first people that I listened to uh, the interview, I didn't do the actual interviews, was a Latino man who grew up in San Francisco. <laughs> and, you know, as everybody knows, if you're going to be gay and you can choose where to be born, you know, there's no better place than San Francisco, probably in the entire world. I don't know, maybe Amsterdam is pretty good. 
So um, I was really stunned. His story of coming out and the difficulties and the oppression that he experienced personally were, as we call it, the old narrative. It wasn't the new narrative of everybody loved me and everybody accepted me. And I was like in the classroom talking about gay heroes. Um, no. And that, I think, in, in, to a large extent, had to do with his background in a religious community. And so we forget how important those, maybe we can call it micro environment, your family, your church, your school, and and how determinant this that is of of your life and and even I mean it's still very different that you can go online and see what it's like to be a, a LGBT person and accepted and get married or whatever have a family that's completely different than when I was a child. But at the same time, the oppression is still serious and leads to regrets and shame and and as I said before, suicide attempts. So um, we need a lot more. A while ago, I did a study looking at school interventions in the context of freedom of uh, uh, speech and whether uh, schools can monitor speech at, at, that is anti-gay speech. And, and, and I was actually thinking schools should not just ban everything, but allow conversation. So I, I did this paper about the issues of the First Amendment in school interventions and concluding that schools could and should be affirmative, but also should allow conversations so that they can change minds and hearts of people, of, of kids and their parents. And one of the one a, a, a school teacher from Los Angeles called me to talk just to talk, and she was a school teacher in the LAUSD, the LA uh, County School System, which is very good in terms of policies. Again, there's a difference between a policy and how it is felt in the individual person's life. And what was she was telling me, and she might have been lesbian herself, I don't know, she didn't come out exactly, but she, again, teaches in a community that is, uh, and I have to again mention religion, uh, uh, the parents would not allow any gay affirmative thing in her school. It was banned by the principal, even though it is against California law, not only LAUSD policies, California law requires you to have gay affirmative, what I would call content. And so again, we see that this, this, this connect between policies, laws, and people's feelings and behavior in the actual communities where gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender kids grow up. But again, at the same time, I, I, I don't want to ignore the many, many kids and people and parents who uh, experience is so different now and so much more positive and promising. Thanks, Alon. Um, and Sabra, maybe in when your comments, because some some questions are coming in on the. There's a lot of questions on the chat. And I'm realizing we need like three hours for this. But um, if is when you're talking about families, um, people are also wondering, um, you know, how. Maybe you can talk in that context about what can be done. There's people who are asking questions as providers for mental health services, like the, child, the kid comes, but the family members don't come. It's the classic uh, child clinician issue where it actually it's maybe the parents that need the intervention, but the child is the presenter, you know? So maybe you can talk a bit about that too. Sure. Um, so I would just say first, I agree with everything that Dr. Davison and Dr. Meyer um, said so far about you know, the heterogeneity of experiences across the country and how change really needs to happen on multiple levels, not just policy. And I would also add that specifically in the context of um, thinking about transgender youth and families, um, the last four years have really set us back in a lot of ways um, in terms of protections for that population. And in particular, there have been a lot of state um, states that have proposed legislation to ban gender-affirming care for minors. That's been a big challenge 
um, particularly for this community. So although we are in general moving in the right direction, I think on the policy level um, and social attitudes levels, I think we have a ways to go. Um, I think specifically in the context of families, there, there is an effort toward you know, really bringing families in into the room, having them um, taking a family systems approach in this work to involve the whole family as much as possible. It is really difficult when families are not on board. And sometimes um, there are differences within one family where one parent is on board and supportive and the other parent isn't. And that causes a lot of challenges for youth trying to access gender affirming treatments if the youth is a minor and needs um, parental consent for those medical treatments or needs you know, help accessing those treatments if they're, in a, if they're not in an urban environment where those um, are available. So I think there, there are a number of um, kind of intervention efforts kind of happening around the country. I'm working on an intervention myself based on the TTFN project to help um, support families that will be an online toolkit that we're, we're working on creating now. So I guess I can say, um, keep trying to bring families in the room and and you know some of the work that I'm doing is specifically focused on how to support the parents and and help them understand why it's important to support their their trans and gender diverse youth. Thank you, Sabra. And just a comment, um, you know, I've seen as I get older, um, I have I have seen families that I thought um, would never sort of be reunited and reconnected. That can happen. I guess I just want to say for people who are on and probably maybe earlier in this process, I've seen families that were torn apart in my 20s and things, and I've seen them, sometimes it takes a very long time, but I have seen change happen. Um, so that is sort of, as I get older, that is something encouraging I have seen sometimes, not obviously in all cases, but um, thank you. Um, we're also getting a lot of questions and we have a question about, maybe Alon can jump in here, about um, intersectionality and how racial and ethnic identities affect mental health of LGBTQ individuals. Um, um, and also I'm thinking of sort of um, when you have stressors from multiple identities, so your experience stress as LGBT, discrimination as LGBTQ and also as a person of color. So I don't know, Alon, do you wanna jump in and maybe? Yeah, I think, I mean, this is a very important uh, as everybody realizes, but you know, it's always been part of my minority stress model to think about the intersection of gender, race, and sexual orientation, because as you said, there are distinct experiences. I, I would just say that sometimes the, the stereotypes about what these distinct experiences are do not uh, uh, get verified in, in research. For example, there is a sense that, or, or, or believe that uh, black communities are more uh, um, homophobic and that is not true based on our, uh, what we see in research in terms of what black LGBT people experience in their communities. Uh, of course, religion is um, difficult, but even with religion, uh, there are religions that have um, supported LGBT people, LGBT relationships, uh, including many Black leaders who have advocated uh, among in the Black church for that. Uh, in terms of religion, it would not be a surprise that the evangelical white uh, uh, Christians are the worst in terms of attitudes. Um, so there's some of those misconceptions. There are also, um, in terms of intersectionality, sometimes the kind of simplistic idea that, well, if being gay is bad and being black is bad, in terms of bad, in terms of, of having discrimination and prejudice directed at you, then being black and gay must be even worse. And we found in several uh, research papers, and not just uh, myself, that that too is overly simplistic. Um, we found, for example, that uh, Black LGBT, uh, certainly LGB people fare much better or, or better than uh, uh, white LGB people in certain uh, outcomes, especially mental health. And there's been se several theories about that. 
uh, as I said, you know, we can't assume that being black leads you to experience more homophobia in your community for one. Uh, but also there's been suggestion there's a certain learned resilience that, that you learn uh, uh, to, to uh, navigate prejudice and stigma in a sense and you learn kind of your self-worth from inside rather than from what people tell you versus perhaps a white privilege that kind of teaches you uh, the opposite. And then when you're become, oh, again, we say realize, but most people uh, kind of have a process where they always kind of renew that they're LGBT. But when you are white, maybe that uh, so this theory goes, is kind of almost more of a shock and you don't know how to deal with being a second class citizen. So there's different theories about uh, that. So, but I think intersectionality is extremely important. Uh, to think about, but just not to be overly simplistic. The other one thing I would say, people always talk about LGBT community, and I always talk about LGBT communities, because even then, uh, we sometimes assume, and, and sometimes people critical of institutions uh, correctly uh, say that it is a white community, but I think that is, um, an error because it ignores not only the fact that there are various communities and also the long history of the black LGBT community that has been supportive, that has been in many ways leading uh, 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 in this uh, um, civil rights and gay rights movement. So I think we need to be more open uh, to to when we think about intersectionality, to think about how uh, Black and Latino people, uh, again, Chicanos in, in California have had a long history of gay rights advocacy uh, in uh, universities and um, in the labor movement. So, um, so we just should not assume being a white LGBT is kind of the best position, uh, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Uh, not to say again, and not to ignore uh, the many ways that white uh, uh, racial um, identity is privileged, of course, uh, but uh, that the relationships are not as simple as we sometimes think they might be. Thanks, Alana. It was very actually that was very illuminating. Um, I'm going to hand over for to Dr. Christina Court, who's going to. Um, start asking some questions from the chat, um, from the uh, Q&A and from the audience. Um, and uh, I apologize ahead of time because we're not gonna get to everyone's questions. So Christina, take it away. Thank you, Karison. All right, so I've been going through um, some of the questions here and one, a couple questions are really focused on wanting to have some more information about what we can do in terms of public health and local com communities. And based on some of the discussion though, what I've been hearing is that we already have pretty good policies that have been developed, but that really part of the issue that we're seeing is that it's not really trickling down to that micro, the micro environment. So in terms of thinking, um, you know, are there additional things that can be done more to address the micro environment level? You know, changes that need to be done aside from just at the policy level. And so. I would just uh, say quickly that um, there is still room for the policy changes you know it, it, it so what i was saying at least is not that those are not effective or not important but they're not enough so so your question is well placed uh but uh there is room and i would just uh, mention one area and i think uh, sabra uh, may talk about it more uh, so if you think about schools, California has one of the most important laws, I think, in terms of the Fair Education Act, FAIR, that requires schools, as I mentioned earlier, uh, to include in their education system, I think the law is about the role and contribution of LGBT people to the history of California, something like that. But it's basically to acknowledge and to provide uh, LGBT students with some information that would be relevant to them and enhance their self-esteem. But it has not been a law that actually required any follow-up or any, there's no required text that, that, so it's kind of being left to the school system. So even a lot of like that, just as an example, that is really great 
Uh, there's still room in the policy and legal arena to implement it in ways that are actually effective. So, so it's a great gesture, and I'm sure in some schools it's done wonderfully, but not everybody, everywhere. And in terms of, uh, I, think, I think we all agree that uh, supporting young students is a core important issue. And I think Sabra talked a little bit about both from the parent side and from the school side. So those are also areas I would agree with. Can I just add one thing um, from the point of view of, uh, I've been involved in, in training, educating and training clinical psychology, PhD students and undergraduates and in, interested in the field for a number of years. And at, at our level, what where I try, I've tried to make my own kind of contribution is in just simply in educating the next generation of mental health helpers um, that in, in the context and the spirit of what we all have been talking about this morning in this little corner of the world that we have on this Zoom uh, seminar, um, that's where I try to, uh, to try to have an impact to, to get people to, um, and th this extends to other areas um, as well in terms of, of, of incorporating um, uh, issues of race and ethnicity and religious values. Well, th these are things which constrain what clinicians do and the way they think about things as I said in my presentation, they, they don't always think about, and basically I, I, I force, I don't really have to force that much, uh, graduate students to, to get into this um, mind space, if you will, and to see it as, you know, in terms of change programs, that's off the table. And, and again, I have to say, that is a total sea change from the way I was educated in graduate school. And, in the, and I was active in that area for my first few years after graduate school before I um, had my own change of uh, perspective, my own conversion, if you will, to um, eliminating this avenue of trying to help people. So this is my one area where contributions, I think at the more micro level uh, can be made. Yeah, I, I can add similar to, to Dr. Davison, thinking about like who will be taking care of or providing services to LGBTQ people in the future and um, have been doing a lot of advocacy work on the medical provider side to make sure that medical providers who are currently being trained, who are already working in the field or who are still medical students are getting um, the education that they need to be able to care for the LGBTQ um, community in an affirming way communities in an affirming way. Okay, so we just have a couple minutes left, but maybe I can try to ask one more question really quickly. So in terms related to what you were already, um, the last question. So there's a question about what are some action steps at a, like at a county behavioral health authority, that a county behavioral health authority can take to support the LGBTQ community who struggle with mental health. So in terms of thinking of, um, yeah, like a county behavioral health authority, like what can be done? Well, I, I think, um, let me have just a quick stab at this. It, I wonder, it allows me to say something about a point that I think Ilan, I think Sabra also made, that conversion therapy attempts can hurt and I alluded to this in my presentation, but didn't have time to go into it. Um, the place, one place where the empirical and the ethical mesh is that is that um, there is there are data, and and we there was clinical lore before the good data that my colleagues have been collecting, and and, and their colleagues that um, attempts to in, in in inflicting a probably most likely ineffective treatment on anybody will likely have iatrogenic effects, that is negative effects brought about, imposed upon the person or the organization or whatever, um, in your efforts to help. And the dirty little secret of psychological interventions as well as medical interventions is that they can harm. Even if they're well intended, they, they can harm. And so we call those iatrogenic effects and, and the, the, uh, the negative effects of any sort of therapeutic intervention were, were documented, I think in the 50s by Alan Bergen, maybe somebody else by from data that were presented and looking close at research studies, you look at the 
at mean differences, but if you look at the 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 uh, the curves in terms of distribution of 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 uh, improvement versus not so good improvement or even negative scores, you'll find that even in treatment groups, you're going to find people who got worse. And and looking just at the group data often blinds us to this. So I think that's this is a, a scientific issue, but it's also, of course, a political and, and, uh, and ethical issue as well. And this has to be impressed upon, backing to this question, somehow has to be communicated to people who do make policy decisions. They may not know about this or they may not think about this. Thank you, that's a very important point. Um, so we're actually out of time now. I'm gonna pass it over to Becca um, to close out the session for today. Hi, everyone. I just really want to thank all of our panelists for this really illuminating um, discussion and want to make sure everyone knows that um, in a couple of days, the recording for this event will be online on our website. And our next event will be on January 21st. And that'll be a conversation between Dr. Kirsten Conan and Dr. Claire regarding the skills training and effective interpersonal regulation narrative therapy, which is used to treat survivors of childhood abuse and interpersonal trauma. Um, so thanks again, everyone. And um, we hope you enjoyed today's conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.